welcome everybody to another episode of the nonprofit show. We're really excited because we are in nonprofit power week with your part-time controller. You might hear us call it YPTC. Um, and we are so excited because we have a new voice on with us, Tanya B. Paul, CPA. Tanya, you're coming to us from Houston, correct? Correct. Well, Tanya, hi, y'all. <laughs> yeah, hi, y'all. We're like, Tanya, you can't wear your cowboy hat on this. <laughs> <laughs> you could. And I then I, of course, would have to get my, my hat on too. Hey, um, we're going to talk about something really important today. Three steps to improve your charity ratings. And this is one of those topics. I can't wait, Tanya, for you to share us. Uh, share with us your knowledge because this is something that we need to be talking about. We're not talking about it enough. And I love that an accounting finance, you know, firm would bring this to the front forefront for us. So I can't wait to get into this discussion. Um, again, if we haven't met, I'm Julia Patrick, CEO of the American Nonprofit Academy. My trusted sidekick, Jarrett Ransom, is not with us today, but she'll be back tomorrow. She's the CEO of the Raven Group, also known as the Nonprofit Nerd. We want to thank all of our presenting sponsors. Without them, we would not be here day in and day out. These are the companies that support not only our nonprofit sector, but the nonprofit show. Bloomerang, American Nonprofit Academy, your part-time controller, Be Generous, Fundraising Academy at National University, Staffing Boutique, Nonprofit Thought Leader, and Nonprofit Nerd. Check them out, as Jared always says, but wait, wait 28 minutes and then you can check them <laughs> out because <laughs> we don't want to miss, have you miss anything. But if you do miss something, you know where to find us. You can get to more than 600 of our archived shows on Roku, YouTube, Vimeo, and Amazon Fire TV. You can also queue us up now for podcasts if that's how you like to consume your, your content. We're on a myriad of streaming platforms. So check us out. We have a new podcast every single day, which is just amazing. Okay, Tanya B. Paul, CPA, Director of Houston, your part-time controller. Welcome, welcome, welcome to the show. Thank you, Julia. Hey, so Tanya, talk to us before we get into these three really important steps. Charity Watchdog sounds a little intimidating. And what are these like ratings and, and what's the purpose of this? I want to even, I just want to say con concept. Yeah, so that's a great place to start. You know, what are Charity Watchdogs? Um, so Charity Watchdogs, they're also, first of all, they're also nonprofits. Um, and what they, their whole mission, their purpose is to really try to help donors make informed choices about the charities that they want, they should support or they want to support. Um, they're called charity watchdogs for a reason. Um, they, you know, they do a lot of analyzing and assessing about information that they glean um, about nonprofits and they post warnings about these organizations if they find something, especially if they're uh, poorly governed or if they're wasteful or if they're inefficient. Um, and Every charity watchdog does things a little bit differently. Um, and so they collect these information and then they evaluate them based on their pers their particular ranking or rating or grading system. Mm -hmm. um, and then it's also important to note that charity watchdogs, because they are nonprofits, um, the way they maintain their independence is they rely on visitors to their websites to donate to them, as well as any subscribers that uses their information regularly. Interesting. You know, it's, it's fascinating to me to think about this because, you know, we, we go by the number 1.8 million registered nonprofits in this country. Mm -hmm. That's a lot going on and it's changing. Are there certain uh, watchdog groups that are by sector or they drill down by region or state or, or how does this work? Or is it just like a free for all across the, the entire country? Great question. Um, so we tend to look at a, a certain subset of the charity watchdog spectrum. So I'll kind of give you a highlight of like the three different kinds that we have been keeping an eye on. So first and foremost is GuideStar. Um, that's the most commonly known um, and used by all kind of all types of people out there. 
they're different in that they allow the, the nonprofit um, to uh, manage the information that they're going to share with them. And then there's a group of nonprofits um, that don't really let the nonprofits volunteer or control. They pull information that's out there readily available to the public. Mm -hmm. So examples like Charity Watch, Give.org, which is a subset of Better uh, uh, BBB, Better Business Bureau, mm -hmm. and then Charity Navigator. So they take information and then they an analyze that data, and then they provide a ranking or a grade or or a score scorecard, if you will. Mm -hmm. And then there's these kind of next gen, if you will, um, type nonprofit uh, watchdogs, charity watchdogs, um, like Give Well great nonprofits, global giving, they're using a lot of the similar types of information about kind of what I just mentioned, but they're trying to start focusing more on impact, storytelling, cost effectiveness, project-based giving. So there's even within the charity watchdog subset, um, we're starting to see specializations in terms of how they uh, present that information to the public. You know, I, I love that you bring that up because um, as we know, what donors want to see and how they're making their decisions is changing dramatically and it, it, it has generational impacts. So I would imagine younger donors, newer donors at the same time might be a little bit more interested in this type of information before making a decision. Absolutely, absolutely. And, and you know, that's the thing. Um, you know, kind of leading into what you're trying to ask me is why does this information matter, right? It's the people who are using this information. Um, there's all kinds of people looking at this information. There's the individual donors, which is the most obvious, right? Um, you know, they, they have a little bit of money to give or they want to give and they're looking for information to make those decisions. Um, you also have volunteers now who want to collaborate with winners. Everyone wants to be tied to a winner, right? Um, so they're looking to see which organizations have good information, especially this younger generation. They're way more in tuned into kind of this depth of information about nonprofits. It's oh, yes. not just based on name alone, just because it sounds like a big organization or a national organization. They really do lift the covers to see what's going on with the organizations that they want to volunteer their time with, um, as well as their money. Um, and then also thinking about stakeholders like banks, um, you know, institutional funders or grant makers, they're looking at this information, right? Um, and then also think about board members or future employees. Um, they're going to take a look at your organization to see, um, you know, if you're an organization that they want to tie their name, their reputation with, right? Yeah. Um, and then also beyond just the peop individual person, Think about the agencies that are picking up this information, um, agencies that are influencing people's behavior in giving. So think about during the pandemic, like Facebook, right, with their with their impromptu kind of pop up giving, or um, you know, like um, the the giving basket, right? Um, all of these organizations are starting to create their own methodology or their own way of influencing people's behavior in giving money. And so if they're touting certain organizations, that's raising the credibility. And where are they going? They're going to these watchdogs to pull that information. Okay. Wow. I love how you framed this up because now let's get, I mean, I'm a believer. If I wasn't before, <laughs> I'm like a total believer, but you have very specific three steps that we can take to improve our charity rating. And step number one, it might be a little surprising because it involves the IRS 990 form. Talk to us about that, Tanya. Oh, goodness. There's so much I can talk about the 990. Um, the first thing I'll tell people is people think IRS form or tax form, and they immediately think numbers and they think, yeah. oh, you're an accountant. That's why you want to talk about the 990. <laughs> well, let me tell you in the nonprofit space, mm -hmm. take a moment, get over your fear of the 990 and flip a couple of pages. And what you're going to actually find is the financial data input into a 990 is actually very minimal compared to all the other information the 990s 
looking for. So what are so some of the areas that I want to focus on so that you guys can kind of think about it is um, pro, uh, program service accomplishments, government and management disclosure, um, and then also compensation. Um, and then finally, the statement of functional expenses. There's four areas in the nonprofit uh, 990 that you really want to take a look at. So let's talk about program service accomplishments. It's if you flip to a 990, go to part three. And what you're going to see are there qualitative questions in that section. Question one is briefly describe the organization's mission. Well, that has nothing to do with numbers. Right. right. It's narrative. It's, it's narrative. narrative. Yeah. And then question two, immediately following it is describe your organization's accomplishments for your top three largest programs. Right. Yeah. And so oh. here's your opportunity to start sharing uh, information about qualitative measures of what you did in the past year as an organization, how you had impact. If you're a homeless shelter, how many clients were you able to get off the streets and provide resources for them. Think about those types of things. Um, the next section, part six on the form is about governance, management and disclosure. Let's take a look at a couple of these questions. Question uh, 12 on there asks, does the organization have a written conflict of interest policy? Yeah. Question 13 is about whistleblowers. Question 14 is about document retention and destruction policy. Question 15 is, what's your process for determining compensation for your key employees? Mm -hmm. um, you know, are you saying yes to these questions, right? That's what they're looking for. What I tell people is, if it's on the 990, you probably should have a policy and procedure um, for it. And if you've been watching your show all week, um, Angela Coxum and my colleague, Jen Oliva, they both have alluded to all of these things, right? So maybe now you're starting to see how the 990 is so important and how you can start telling a story. You know, I think it's really an interesting thing that all three of you ladies have brought up is that they're not saying and attach this document to this form. They're just mm -hmm. saying, is it a yes or a no? Exactly. And, and so I think that's really, to me, that's really interesting, interesting because I like how you phrase this, that it means, or you can interpret that the IRS is saying, this is important. And so this should be done. We're not saying how it should be done, what it looks like, but your COI policy, your whistleblower policy should be structured, I guess would be the word and in, and in practice. So I love this. I, I always think of the schedule O should be renamed to schedule opportunity <laughs> because it seems to me that this is that narrative. This is that place where we can really tell people about, uh, about our work. Exactly. And you know, that's the other thing when I teach this, um, these topics to nonprofits, um, here locally, that's one thing I tell them, you should be looking at your 990 as a marketing tool. Yeah. You should be refreshing that information every year. You know, the three programs that hit it out of the park last year may not be the three programs that hit it out of the park this year. So look, take a closer look at that because everyone's reading it, whether you like it or not. <laughs> okay, now let me let me throw a curveball. So get your, your mitt up because <laughs> if you have quote unquote bad information or something you know was in decline or you you had some issue do you report that there in in some of these narratives or or do you try to you know make it all rah rah yay team kind of information i mean it's a marketing tool so you want to be a little bit more on the rah rah side but you also want to be transparent yeah. that's the key right so okay. if something went wrong so let's take the pandemic that's a great example yeah. right okay, yeah programs shut down across the nation uh, globally right yeah. and so if you don't if you didn't put that information how you were adversely affected by okay. your programs getting shut down are you really being honest and transparent yeah. Okay. Right. But the spin on that, the marketing spin on that is we were not able to address program A, B and C, which historically we've done, you know, a fantastic year over year for decades. Right. But we pivoted in a time of crisis and we created a new program and did 
ABC, right? So that's that's how you can have that spin. Okay. Yeah, I like that. I like that you helped us to understand that because rule number one, transparency, or I should maybe not rule, but goal. You know, getting that um, piece in place um, because that filters across all aspects of the donor relationship and stewardship. And and to your your point, the, the different people that are that are watching. Now, one of your your next steps, step number two, which I can't wait to hear more about this, is that you say earn a guide star platinum seal of transparency there's that word again how do we do this yeah so remember at the beginning i told you that there's all these different types of charity watchdogs mm -hmm. guide star it, we recommend starting with guide star because you can actually control how much information you want to uh, share with the public out there. So GuideStar has four levels um, of seals of transparency. It starts with bronze, um, and then silver, then gold, and then platinum. And then depending on how much information you're sharing, it's a progressive elevation from bronze oh. to silver to gold to platinum. Okay. Um, and, you know, when, if you take a look at it and if you read kind of the GuideStar self-help, like how you should, you know, fill all this information out, you can actually go from a zero, um, zero information transparency profile to a fully platinum transparency profile in less than an hour. They say 45 minutes. I'm going to let you take a coffee break and say it's an hour. Um, and so, it, you know, the bronze takes five minutes. All you need to do is provide very basic information. What's the organization's name? What's their mission? Who's the primary contact and information on how to reach you and how you can, how an organ, how a person or an organization can donate. Mm -hmm. And then the silver is a little bit more information. The gold want, the gold standard wants um, a little bit of financial information, a little bit of information about the board, leadership demographics. Mm -hmm. And the platinum is really not that hard either. They want you to share a fairly recent strategic plan answer a couple of goal questions, and then provide at least one financial metric. Wow. You know, I love this because I have to admit to you when, you know, seeing these on websites and on the websites of our guests that are, that appear on the nonprofit show and, and how you, you might hear somebody um, use this, uh, you know, phrase, well, we, you know, we've achieved the uh, platinum seal of transparency it seems like it's a really daunting and, and challenging thing to do. It's not, it really is not. It's, I mean, if you go out there and they've done such a beautiful job on their website, you know, you can go out there and it really gives you step-by-step -step guidance mm -hmm. on exactly what you need. So even before you log in, um, you can, you know, pull all your information beforehand and then just go in and update it. And here's the thing, as soon as you register with the IRS, you already have a profile out there. GuideStar automatically creates a profile out there. It, you just have to go and claim it. So it's not like you're making a request that they have to set it up. It's already out there. You just have to claim it. It doesn't take that much effort to claim it. There's a whole process on there that you can do. And then you just start filling out the information. And here's the thing. You can, you can start with bronze. Let's say you don't have all the information, you know, start today, start with bronze, make it a goal to increase your level of transparency once a week, spend 15 minutes once a week. And, and by the end of the month, you'll have a platinum a seal of transparency. I love it, Tanya, you're my soul sister, because that's kind of the way I, I think about these things, you know do a piece, do a piece, move forward. And yeah, yeah it's I'm just like anything, it. you know, I'm like that too. You know, if I think of something as a big project, it becomes that black cloud that follows me. Right, right. Oh my gosh. I love it. Now, before we go on to step three, um, you know, things change. So I'm assuming is, is this a, a seal that only lasts 12 months or the, a calendar year or how, how is this, uh, managed in, in essence by GuideStar? Great question. Um, so what we recommend is every best practice dictates that every accounting department at a nonprofit 
um, organization should have a finance calendar. And in that finance calendar, you know, you think of the obvious things, right? Yeah. You know, reviewing your audit, prep planning for your audit, making sure your 990 is taken care of. You know, you have all the grant reporting deadlines. But we also recommend at least once a year, go out and look at your ratings across the board and especially your GuideStar rating. GuideStar is making um, enhancements every year in terms of questions that they're asking because they're trying to tap into what the trends are. So one of the things we didn't talk about is remember like these nonprofit charity watchdogs, they're starting to think about other things other than just the basic financial metrics, um, impact, all of those types of things. So GuideStar is adding questions every year. And when you go in to renew the information, they actually put a little asterisk on all the new questions. So it's not like you have to hunt and you know look for what the new question is this year. It's, mm -hmm. it's highlighted for you. So you just go out there, figure out what the new question is, go find the answer and plug it right in. And so we recommend at least once a year, if you don't change it or update it in every two years, um, you will drop off on your seal of transparency. Okay, cool. That's a good thing to know. Um, okay, well, now I'm really interested to have you dig deep into step three, because step three is, is not necessarily one that I would have automatically thought of, um, and that's tell stakeholders about the rating. It kind of goes back to what you said, or what I, I heard you say in the very beginning, that your 990 should be looked at as a marketing tool. Yep. So, you know, really tell people about it. You know, it's, it's kind of a, 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 be a little bit braggy about what your organization has accomplished through the year. So you're doing all this hard work in your 990 and you're being careful about the information you're putting in there and you're doing your annual newsletters and your, you know, your websites out there, but it's more than that these days. It's social media. It's, um, you know, making sure your website's refresh, interactive, sharing with people when you get the seal of trend. If let's say today you only have bronze after this show, you're inspired to go out and get a, you know, a platinum seal of transparency, make that a marking an event, make it a, you know, a reason to reach out to your potential donors and tell them about it. Make sure those, you know, those seals or your ratings, if it's great, put it near where your donation links are or embed it into your conversation about your annual you know, newsletter. Say this year we upgraded from a seal, bronze seal to a platinum seal. There's so many ways to tell a story. Social media is all about telling so stories. So make sure your website is fresh. It, make it engaging, make it so that people wanna come back. Think about the things that the charity watchdogs are looking at, right? They're looking at financial metrics. They're looking at impact. They're looking at community engagement. Um, they're looking at transparency. Put that information on your website. Make it obvious so that when these charity watchdogs are coming to your website, looking at your newsletters, looking at what you're putting in your 990, the information is easy for them to grab, to reshare and do their rankings and their ratings, but also for your would-be donors. And then one additional piece that I've started telling my clients and um, the, the clients, uh, nonprofits that I teach is become even smarter, be ahead of the curve. And when you have that platinum seal and you have those great rankings and ratings with these uh, charity watchdogs, Teach your donors, tell them why you are the best and why they should always keep you at the top of their donor list. Because guess what? Just like you're looking for new donors, there are other nonprofits waiting in the wings, trying to glean a, a dollar or more right. from your donors. And you want those, don once you, it's so hard to get those donors, you want to keep them loyal. So you got to give them reasons of why they should stay loyal to you. I love that. You know, I think that's really wise because it also, Tanya, it helps the whole sector. So yes. it's not just about your individual um, organization, but, you know, we're talking about this all the time. Like, how do we elevate the professionalism and the operations and the, the you know, frankly, the credibility of our sector? I mean, how yeah. do we do that? And so I love that you've talked about this really, really important stuff. Now, I've got to say one thought I've had, and I, I've got to ask you this. 
<laughs> I'm a little surprised that it's um, the finance department pushing this. It seems to me that this should be something that development is doing or does development working hand in hand with the finance department because they're the ones talking with those donors. But so I'd love to get your opinion on that because it's, Absolutely. it's very um, interesting to me. And it really kind of comes back to why we started talking about it, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, we try to say that your CFO, your controller, especially if you have a YPTC controller or CFO in your midst, um, we want to be more than just the number cruncher. We like to do the an analysis. We want to be your trusted advisor, right? Mm -hmm. And so one of the things that we see is some of these analytics that we're doing that we're presenting to the board in our in our monthly financial packets. That's what the charity watchdogs are looking at, right? Mm -hmm. And so as a as a development director, you're more focused on who I, who do I strategically go out and get? But we're trying to help the development director have the tools. Yeah. that they need to speak intelligently and eloquently and financially savvy um, so that they do convince those would-be donors and grant makers to give money to them versus another nonprofit. I love that you said that because, you know, um, we see this too often. Those development teams are like off in their own area. Accounting finance is off in another area. Now with work from anywhere. Yeah, work together. Yeah, and... and, and, and and I love what you said, you know, the information that's there needs to be shared and used. I Super cool, super cool that you came to us today to talk about this because uh, you gave me a completely new perspective. And awesome. uh, <laughs> I got to say, in, in more than 600 shows, I've never had anyone talk about this the way you have here today. So that's that's just been amazing i i know that there's so much more that ypcc um shares and i just want everyone to know that there's a really cool piece of the yptc.com website and it's called accounting resources and before you're like oh snoozer it's not <laughs> at all just about numbers it's fascinating fascinating information um Everything from, you know, how to communicate numbers to your board, how to share information. You've got some great articles about um, digitally presenting information and how that looks. Really cool, really cool information. And it's remarkable because it's free. You don't have to be a client of YPTC to get access to this information, which bravo to, to you all because um, this is really uh, powerful stuff. So YPTC.com, check them out um, for that information. Okay, Tanya, you've been just fabulous. How was your first time on the nonprofit show? Oh, I'm, I'm excited that I was able to make you jazzed because that was my big fear that you've already heard everything after <laughs> 600 shows. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, listening to, um, you know, I did my homework too, and I listened to Angela and Jen before they came. So I was really excited that I was able to tie in some of the things that they did to reinforce, like, it, it's all connected. It's it all is. connected. You know, I, I think that's one of the things that I've learned um, from you, your team, is, and from you, even today, it's been amplified, is that... Um, Accounting, we, we tend to seize up. We're like, oh my God, numbers, spreadsheets, uh, yeah, you know, and, but yet it really is where we need to be thinking. It's more of a strategic aspect. Um, and, and so it has implications far greater than just, you know, a balance sheet. So I love that you could come on and share that. Now, you told me that you have to get going right after this <laughs> episode because what are you doing, my friend? So I'm um, the finance chair for a local organization called Memorial Park Conservancy. And today we're reviewing the audit draft so that we can review, approve, and then present it to the board next week. So I yes. <laughs> so not only are you practicing, you know, in the sector, which I'm very grateful for, but you're practicing in your community. So bravo to you, bravo Thank to you. you. That's, that's <laughs> not an easy thing. Well, Tanya, we hope we get you back on again. I, um, this has been an amazing process for us to share this time. Nonprofit Power Week only happens a couple times a year. Jared and I are very, very specific about how we want to 
take our content and share information and 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 put it together in a way that really is is a, a deep dive and so um, this is really an exciting thing for us. Again, we want to thank all of our partner sponsors, Bloomerang, American Nonprofit Academy, your part-time controller, Be Generous, Fundraising Academy at National University, Staffing Boutique, Nonprofit Thought Leader, and the Nonprofit Nerd. Okay, Tanya, I'm going to let you go because you have a board meeting. Thank you, Julia. It was great to spend the afternoon with you. Hey, it's been a lot of fun. And as we like to end every episode of The Nonprofit Show, we want to remind ourselves, our viewers, our listeners, our guests to stay well so you can do well. Thanks so much, everybody. We'll see you.